no one's ever done something like this. That is taking this new set of tools that are unquestionably having a dramatic effect on healthcare's future and to bring all the disciplines together, all the experts, and start to plan how to use these effectively. And what can we do to really benefit patients with all these newfound capabilities? The fact that you can get a warning on your wrist through your watch that your heart rhythm isn't right, or you could get your potassium in your blood through your watch. These are some things that we wouldn't have anticipated. So the fact that you can get your genome sequence, that you can get your gut microbiome sequence, there's so many ways to understand each human being like never before. What it means is we can get remarkably more productive, that we don't do mass screenings, but we know who should be watched for whatever particular condition, that in the future we could prevent things like asthma attacks and seizures and heart attacks and strokes and far better management of things like diabetes uh, and high blood pressure. So there's all sorts of opportunities of improving our workflow and patient management, reading scans, slides, looking at skin lesions. These are all patterns that are better for machines to process at high throughput accurately and then have human clinical oversight. And that's where this is landing. This is a combination of doing the things best that machines do, but also that uh, clinicians can do. There isn't any question that over time, and we're talking not just immediately, but in the five to 10 year time frame, we're gonna see some immense productivity improvement. So for example, if somebody was uh, instead of going into uh, a regular hospital room, they could go home and be on sensors and be continuously monitored with artificial intelligent algorithms. That's just one example of how we're gonna see changes. And when that happens, think of all the different people that are affected. For example, we're gonna need more data scientists, of which there are relatively few, and we'll have the types of specialties which are gonna be very much supported through machine learning and AI, we may have less. And, and if we ever get the remote monitoring together, we may have less hospital personnel. So we're gonna see dynamic changes across the board uh, over the years ahead. But there will be new areas that will grow, just as there are areas that will see uh, some reductions. So this is something that's bigger than the NHS. It really will be transformative that eventually, just a matter of time, that the patient will be truly the center. And clinicians will be rescued from the despair of not being able to care for patients well because they're so burdened with so much uh, keyboards and administrative and all these other things that divert them from what they really want to do, why they went into healthcare and medicine in the first place. And then we obviously want to see the productivity in these health systems. So each of these areas will eventually be revolutionized over time. Maybe it'll take 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And we'll look back now in 2018 as this thing rolled out is that we were able to really nail it of what is the biggest advantage of bringing all these tools together. So for the staff on the NHS frontline, I think this is a really exciting time for them. This is their chance to really get involved in shaping the future of work in the medical workforce um, and have a real chance to have a say at how they can improve their direct patient caregiving time, provide more time for patients, less burdensome administrative work, um, using advanced digital technologies to help them do that. We're not going to be tearing up the rule book about how medicine is practiced. What we're going to be doing is slowly rewriting and editing the rules as we go along, as technology is slowly introduced into the NHS. And I think it's important for us to be realistic in our predictions of the impact on the workforce and how we're going to change the way that we work. We need to start with the people at the end of the spectrum where the high level of health need and the high level of digital exclusion sits because if we can get this access to improved health care and more digitally enhanced health care right for those people, then it will work for everyone all the way along the spectrum. The risk we need to avoid is getting it right for the worried well who will become more worried and we won't get the health care improvements that we're really looking for. So we've got to start with those people. Increasing engagement in one's own health and having apps and wearables and things like that which make it easier to do that 
will, I think, motivate people to do so more. If it is, frankly, more convenient to do it, because you don't get a letter offering you an appointment on a day that you can't make, you ring up to try and change, you can't get any answer, and all this nonsense. If you've got an actual app that can come and look at your diary and say, right, this person's free on that date, that's your appointment, then, you know, it's going to be more convenient to engage. I'm using technology in a number of different ways, but the ones that I'm using almost every day in my practice I can show you right now. So this is my phone and it's in a case that handily contains two useful technologies. And the first is a Cardia Alive Core single lead ECG. And what this allows me to do is record a clinical grade single lead ECG of patients to identify if they have any irregularities in their heart rate. And this Tim Otoscope allows me to see in great detail on the screen of my phone into a person's ear and not only capture that image and save it to their record, but also show it to the patient and help come to a common understanding of their condition. This other technology that I use is virtual reality. If you're anxious about having blood tests, patients can take this, be distracted, have their fear and pain reduced and allow them to have a more comfortable experience. Whilst I might try technologies and explore them and share them with patients and hopefully explore new ways of delivering care, my mind is always on about how this might improve the care of the patient and the working environment of the clinicians there as well. And if I was going to do that by just simply putting any technology in front of them, I would clearly fail. So it's incumbent on me as a doctor to ensure that the technologies that we're using are going to be applicable and accessible to everyone. We know that there are huge amounts of information which are being generated every day about people's illnesses and about chronic disease. How can any one healthcare worker keep this in their mind at any one time? They need to know where that information is, is present and they need to be able to access it very easily. So the question for the future is what knowledge will people need to know and where will it need to reside? People like me and other people have these sort of things attached to them because we're neurotic about our health. But if you're in a sinker state and you've got three kids, you're on your own in a high rise and you've got two or three jobs to hold down, you don't have time for any of this and you don't have the money for any of this and yet your health needs are probably greater. So we need to look at how we bring those people along. Do we prescribe things like this? And also how we help them to understand them and to make them work. So it's about a partnership. This is true partnership and collaboration. The importance of this uh, review and the changes that, that are happening is that I think it will make the NHS certainly much more efficient in the way we run it uh, because we can deploy these new technologies, particularly digital, to connect with patients, to connect with the public, artificial intelligence to tell us in advance whether there are changes happening to a person which we need to, which may help us to prevent diseases happening. And genomics, of course, is very important in terms of understanding the nature of people's diseases, why they develop them, predict why they do it. And indeed, with time, there may be opportunities of obviously manipulating the genome as well to advantage patients. If you want to do with genomics, there's a huge amount of data. Let's assume a, a, a situation in the next 20, 30 years, where most of us might have our DNA sequenced. Now that requires the data, that's 30, you know, that's 3 billion base pairs, 3 billion letters, the alphabet we'll be sequencing. And the question is, where do we store it? How do we access that information for patient benefit? And so on. So we need another type of workforce as well in the NHS. I have a lot of confidence in the NHS workforce being able to adapt. We adapted over time as advances have happened. With the introduction of electronic health records, there is a lot of data entry that is happening that is taking the clinician from the patient and looking at the computer, and very little is returned. We are moving now with artificial intelligence in a new era where this data that's collected in electronic health records is going to be now used to empower the clinician and the patient such that better care can be delivered by the clinician. But I think from the patient point of view, I see an era of empowerment where this data is not only collected by themselves, but also can be used 
to change lifestyle patterns, to provide incentives to us to probably eat better, to exercise more. We are a patient that may have cardiovascular disease, may have a variety of wearables as well as apps that can enable them to, to really monitor themselves, identify when certain patterns have changed and contribute to their well-being rather than completely uh, letting it on the nurses and clinicians that are taking care of them. So they will need to be much more participant in their well-being. So I feel that this will be a very, very useful process for us.